Um, I'd like to thank you very much, and thank you guys very much for giving us the opportunity to be here. Both Lisa and I are the first time in Australia, um, and we've been very excited to come here, and it's very excited to be able to meet you guys. I think meetings like this are extremely powerful uh, for the families, for the medical students, and for those in the healthcare service, and I think this kind of demonstrates that the TS community is a very special one and a very strong one. Um, so as we said, I was asked to kind of talk about the common goal, improving outcomes for people with TSC. Uh, and what Claire asked me to do is give a quick, kind of put quick in parentheses, because when she asked me to give quick, I kind of chuckled, because I could talk about TSC for four hours. <laughs> uh, so we'll start with a quick overview of TSC, realizing that people in the audience have kind of different backgrounds and exposures to it. And then we'll talk to, turn to providing care to people with TSC. Um, what are some of the key challenges that are faced? What are some of our opportunities? And what are some of our resources? Um, so first, I'd like to tell you about my friend Michael. And for years now, I've started many of my talks talking about Michael, because um, Michael has taught me probably more in my career than a lot of other people and other things. Um, and Michael, when he was four years old in 1960, normal, healthy, rambunctious little boy, his pediatrician became very concerned about these bumps on his cheek and actually sent him to Children's Hospital in Boston, afraid that Michael could have leukemia. Uh, Michael went to Children's, was diagnosed with TSC, uh, and kind of, that was that. He'd never had a seizure. There was no family history. As you can imagine, in 1960, there wasn't a whole lot known about TSC. Uh, Michael continued to be followed pretty closely annually. Uh, and when he was 12 years old, his mother called the pediatrician and said that Michael had been having flu-like symptoms, headache, vomiting. No one else in the family was really ill and no fever. Uh, pediatrician called the neurologist at Children's who said knowing TSC, he'll likely need surgery. Uh, but knowing T this is TSC, there's no urgency. Uh, Michael went into Children's back then in 19, this was then 1970. No CT scans, really, no MRI scans. Um, they knew that he likely had a subependymal giant cell tumor. Uh, difficult to say which side it was on. Uh, so they actually did a pneumoencephalogram on Michael, which was injecting air into the spinal cord so they could try and visualize this. Um, they then needed to do a technician brain scan to say which ventricle was this tumor in. And by the time they identified that and Michael had his surgery, the brain was under such increased pressure um, that he had a major stroke. Uh, so at the time, he was 12, cognitively normal, no history of seizures. Following that surgery, cognitively impaired, refractory epilepsy. Um, Michael went on to live his life with TS. He's now in his late 50s. Um, and he really has taught me a lot because through his road with TS, it's not just been the SEGA, it's not just been the seizures, not just the cognitive impairment. He's lost a kidney due to angiomyolipoma. I mean, over years, he also lost the ability to ambulate for reasons we don't really understand. Um, but what really has impressed me about Michael is he never gave up the quest to just live his life and not let TSC own him. So kind of with Michael in mind then, I'd like to start this kind of overview. And first with the key messages, I think, of what I'd like to convey this morning is that TSC is not rare. I mean, I think the TSC community really needs to continue to, to use this and make this so it becomes more aware and people are more familiar with it, both in the medical community and maybe especially in the medical community, but also in the lay community. Also, TSC can and often does affect every organ system. And as I think we all know, the brain and the skin are the most frequently affected, both involved about 90, 95% of individuals with TSC. I'm also, I think, as this group knows, um, but is extremely important, that individuals with TSC need to be closely followed throughout their lifetime. One of the things that will be talked about in the next few days is what can happen when with the different organ systems in TS. And it can be very complicated and confusing. And I think in order to really minimize the impact of TSC in an individual's life, people really need to be closely followed. Also, it, we've tried to make the point for many years that TSC serves as a great model system um, for epilepsy, autism, tumor growth, et cetera, trying to interest the wider medical and scientific community that from characterizing these things and understanding them better in TSC um, it will provide general knowledge for the disorders in the, in the bigger population. And I think finally we have much more to learn about tuber sclerosis complex to be able to reduce the impact in many lives. It's been a really exciting and we'll look, it's been a very exciting time the past 15, 20 years in TS and I think that will continue. Um, and so hopefully we'll make great strides in the future. So first, we know TSC is a genetic disorder. The incidence is about 1 in 5,500 to 6,000. So again, making the comment that it's not rare. My husband one day asked me if I was sure it wasn't 1 in 3, because um, it's not unusual <laughs> for us to make new diagnoses every week. Um, last week, I diagnosed a 70-year-old woman. Uh, the oldest person I've made a new diagnosis in is 78. 
Um, so it's not rare. Probably would be much more common than that when we get even better at detecting it. We know it's autosomal dominant disorder, although two-thirds of the cases appear sporadic without a family history. And we know that two genes have been identified, the TSC1 gene and the TSC2 gene. Uh, and we can identify a disease-causing mutation in one of those two genes in 85% of individuals who meet clinical criteria. We know that TSC2 mutations are more common. Uh, and we also know that overall TSC2 mutations have a more severe phenotype. Um, and we've recently also shown that some of the people we could not identify a disease-causing mutation in is because they're mosaics, meaning they don't contain a copy of the mutation in every cell of their body, uh, but enough cells are involved to allow them to be led to the clinical diagnosis of TSC. Um, we also know that in TS there is a very wide phenotypic variability, including within families. Um, we take care of a couple four-generation families with several people with TS and all sharing the same mutation. Some are very mildly affected, others are severely affected. Um, we don't know why that is, but something we'd like to understand. And we also know that gender somehow matters, and at least we'll talk more about LAM, which we know occurs almost exclusively in women. We now know that some men can have it, but we don't know why it's much more common in women. Uh, and also another gender difference in TSC is with autism, whereas in TSC several groups have shown that it affects girls and boys equally, whereas in the general autism population, autism affects boys four times as frequently. Uh, so we don't know why that is. Uh, and then also a lot of the talking, as many of you know, very importantly in the world of tuberous sclerosis is with the identification that the TSC1 and TSC2 um, proteins are components of the mTOR signaling pathway. Kind of when we talk about TS, I always like to talk about the history of it too because I think it's interesting. It was first described in the 1800s uh, and then sometime in the early, late 1800s, 1900s, uh, it was a description of people with mental retardation, seizures, and angiofibroma. Uh, as the vote called votes triad necessary for the diagnosis of TS. And we now know that actually that triad is present in less than a third of people with TS. Uh, the 1993, the TSC2 gene was discovered. In 1997, the TSC1 gene discovered. And then in 2002, as we just said, the proteins were found to be part of the mTOR signaling pathway. In 2008, clinical trials with rapamycin were initiated. Uh, and then in 2011, the FDA in the United States approved Everolimus. Uh, for the treatment of subependal giant cell tumors and re renal AML and TSC. And then this year, rapamycin was approved by the FDA for the treatment of LAM. So really, I think if you look for, from the 1800s when this was first described to the past 20 years, there's been an incredible amount of knowledge gained uh, and treatment options become available. This is a very simplified um, image of this pathway. Uh, but this was really a miracle, and how this happened was there were two labs in the United States. One, Lou Cantley's lab, who was working on what was then called the PI3 kinase signal transduction pathways, how proteins affect each other in cells, mainly because that pathway, a lot of the proteins are implicated in bad human cancers. Then there was a lab at Yale, Tian Shu, who was looking at insulin signaling in Drosophila fruit flies, and both labs around the same time found a protein. They went to protein databases, and they saw that we were looking at the TSC2 protein. And that was honestly a miracle. Um, if I woke up this morning with the cure for TS, it would be a billion dollars in 10 years before that was available. When this was identified, rapamycin was already sitting on pharmacy shelves in the United States, so readily available to go into animal models and then clinical trials. So really pretty miraculous. TSC remains a cl clinical diagnosis, although DNA testing now that's available also can play a role. And in 2012, a group of us got together an international conference to revise the diagnostic criteria. And I think importantly, to, again, multi-system involvement. Ev almost every organ system can be and is involved in TSC. And to be diagnosed with definite TSC, an individual has to have two major criteria, and we'll look at those in a minute, or one major feature and two minor features. And then we also have this concept of possible TSC, and I think this is also very important because as many as you guys know, different things with TSC can occur at different times during an individual's life. Um, so if a person has one major feature or two or more minor feature, that individual also needs to be closely followed to see if they do develop other features and if they do indeed have TSC, uh, we can also work as hard to mi minimize the impact of the disorder um, on their health. So looking quickly at the criteria, the major criteria, as you can see, include several from the skin and the brain. Um, and this is important for us to get the word out to the medical community, because if I went into a dermatologist when I was an adolescent worried that I might have bad acne, um, and the dermatologist instead thought this might be facial angiofibroma and noticed either periangle fibroma or white spots, then in that office that day, I could and should be diagnosed with tuberous sclerosis complex. 
Um, the lack of this awareness is actually what leads to often a delayed diagnosis of TSC. Similarly, if I was a five-year-old child, whoops, sorry, if I was a five-year-old child and went into an emergency room having a new onset seizures and I had a CT scan or a brain MRI which showed cortical tubers or subependymal nodules, um, then I could and should be that day diagnosed with tuber sclerosis complex. All the other testing is done just to mainly to document other organ involvement, again, trying hard to keep people with TSC healthy. Um, so those are the major criteria, and then major criteria are things that we see very, very frequently in TSC. They can be seen in the general population, but it's kind of uncommon to see them uh, in the general population. And then these are the minor features, which are things we see also commonly in TSC, um, but they're also seen more frequently in the general population. So those are the diagnostic criteria. Uh, and then kind of turning from that quick overview to what are the challenges of taking care of a person with TS. And I think about this both from the medical perspective and then also from the family perspective. Um, so from a medical perspective, it's a really, really complicated medical disorder. And I think I'm glad there are medical students here because I always tell the Harvard medical students, I think that this is the disorder every medical school should focus on. Um, because of its multi-system involvement and the complexity of it. Um, but as we said, it's multi-system involvement. <coughs> different things happen at different times. Uh, in the United States now, most of the TS clinics are run by neurologists. Um, and yet, especially as people age, because issues other than the neurologic issues, they really become kind of a paramount importance in that person's life. Mental health issues, particularly anxiety, and I'm glad Beatrice was here to talk about TN because the mental health aspects of TSC are often under-recognized, under-appreciated, and often have profound impact on an individual's life. Um, particularly that anxiety, really, really common. We find particularly with our adults with TS, that can sometimes complicate their care. Um, it just makes providing care to them more difficult because they get very anxious about different aspects, including their interactions and relationships with us. And then also, as was mentioned earlier, children with TSC grow up, um, and what then? Um, also in the United States, we'll talk a little bit about the clinics. Most of the clinics are pediatric clinics, um, and people get very good, or children get pretty good comprehensive care, but then as the children grow up, um, they lose specialists who are aware of TS. The families lose, lose the care team um, network that they've had. Um, so I think that this is a big challenge facing, I think, us worldwide with regard to caring for individuals with TSC. And then from an individual with TSC or the family perspective, I think it's all of that. All of the things we just mentioned are, are count challenges for people living with TSC, and it's way much more than that. Um, delays in diagnosis, which still in 2015 happen, um, can lead to an incredible sense of guilt um, and anger for parents. Uh, last week in Boston was the TS Community Alliance on Infantile Spasms, because this is Infantile Spasms Awareness Month in the United States. Both parents who talked are really painful because when their baby started these unusual movements, both parents, and I found in my experience almost, I think there's only, with all the years I've done this, without exception, only one parent who didn't get that this was something very unusual. But these parents kept taking their babies to the physician saying something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. Um, and their concerns kept being discounted for different reasons. Um, and so there was a delay not only in the diagnosis of spasms and the treatment of spasms, and we know that has great impact. So both of these parents carry incredible guilt that they had not been, I think they were pretty amazingly strong advocates for their children, but they had not been strong enough advocates that that negatively impacted their child's life. Uh, so I think that's a huge, huge challenge for people and parents living with this. Then the lack of awareness and understanding can also lead to a sense of isolation and often helplessness. I think most people I take care of, first time they met a physician were diagnosed with TS, the physician had never seen another person with TS. Um, and I think that any of us, if we had a healthcare problem and we were going to see a healthcare professional and they had no clue what we had, um, doesn't, it's not really confidence inspiring. And I think it really does cause this incredible sense of loneliness and helplessness. And then, as was said, TSC affects not just the individual, um, but the family. And I so agree uh, that in our families, sometimes the siblings become also the handicapped ones because so much focus is put on the health care needs and needs of that child, even though families and most families I know are trying to juggle the care of all of their children and maintain life. Um, but it really is something that the family needs to be taken care of as well as the person living with TSC. And then just a couple of comments that folks that I take care of said we hear a lot is many people will say that living with TSC is like walking in a minefield. Um, right now it might be the seizures or something, but the next step you take is there going to be a problem with the kidney or a problem with other aspects of TS. Again, a big challenge with a disorder with uncertainty down the road. 
Uh, and then other families will say, we're just always waiting for the sky to fall or the other shoe to drop. Um, so it is. There's many, many key challenges in living with this disorder and taking care of people with this disorder. So this was just to give a quick summary of three of my folks. Um, so Kaylee is a three-year-old girl with TSC. Um, she was diagnosed with cardiac rhabdomyoma, and she is the only kid I've taken care of all these years that as her rhabdomyomas start to regress, they started pulling on the mitral leave um, valves. So we thought she might need a mitral valve replacement just because of the regression of this rhabdomyoma. Unfortunately, she didn't. She also has refractory epilepsy, autism, and a subependymal giant cell tumor. She also has behavioral difficulties. So every time she has an explosion of behavioral difficulties, where is it the SEGA or is it just the behavioral aspects of TSC? Then there's Margaret, who's a 10-year-old girl with TSC, who has a history of refractory epilepsy. Uh, she has learning problems. She's actually doing really well, and she wants to be a, um, a actor or actress when she grows up. She has an interparenchymal SEGA. SEGAs are usually in the ventricle, um, but not always. Rarely they can be in the brain matter itself. So she has one of those and is now on, on a Finitor um, because it can't be completely surgically resected. She has kidney AML. Uh, and then she also is one of our group of TS that we'll talk about later in the less common phenotype talks. She has had a history of a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor that was resected. And then Paul, who's also taught me an awful lot about TS, who's 36. He had heart surgery as an infant. He now is a pacemaker. He has a history of refractory seizures. He's had epilepsy surgery in the past few years. A history of significant anxiety. It was actually meeting Paul that first really helped me understand how significant this anxiety can be. He has really significant facial angiofibroma, and actually when he was a child, it was very tough for him because it was a constant reminder when he looked in the mirror that he had TSE, and he was also bullied a lot by his friends because of these bumps on his face. He lost a kidney to a very large AML. Um, he probably shouldn't have lost it, but again, in learning about healthcare and TSC, he has significant AMLs in his remaining kidney, um, and he is one of three men we have with LAM. So again, just kind of demonstrating that it's a very complex disorder, and every person walking this path um, has a different story. So then kind of providing the care to people with TSC, what are our opportunities? And I do think we're getting better at keeping people with TSC healthy. Um, they're the 2012 International Consensus Guidelines, not only for the diagnosis, how do you diagnose someone with TS, but how do you follow people with that TS to identify the problems as they rise so we can manage them. And then there are an increasing number of multidisciplinary clinics. Um, in the United States, there are now almost 50 clinics. And when I started this, there were about six. Um, and so that's been really, really exciting. And I think that there are other clinics kind of rising up around the world that really are able to address different aspects of this disorder. And then they're improving therapies and technologies. mTOR inhibitors have been huge, but just in the treatment of epilepsy alone, we have 15 new medicines in the last 10 years. The involvement of magnetoencephalogram or imaging modalities are helping us identify seizure foci, other things more readily, so we can also um, kind of more successfully manage those. And then I think as we'll talk a lot about also this week, the research is also teaching us a lot. Uh, so Claire had also asked me to just tell you really briefly about our program. Um, the Herscott Center, which was dedicated in 2005. So this is our 10th anniversary, which we've been kind of excited about. Um, we have seen over 800 individuals in those 10 years. So we see people not only with TS, but people come to, with, to us for um, a possible diagnostic evaluation. And we're actively following over 500, and ch 500 children and adults with TS. So my youngest patient is yet to be born. My oldest patient is 84. Um, so a kind of 50% adults, 50% kids. And we really do try to provide multidisciplinary comprehensive care throughout the individual's lifetime. When this program initially started, it was me. And I kind of sail that at other programs in the United States a lot because it can be a little intimidating to look at what we have now and think, how could we possibly do that? So it was me. And I think that's what it takes as a person with an interest and a passion in providing care to people with TSC. Um, but it would snowballed kind of at the MGH, and we now have over 40 specialists um, involved in both the pediatric and adult care. Um, I think what is the key component of our group, and I think any TS program really, is we have our dedicated psychiatrist, social worker, nurse, and coordinator um, to really help, again, with the importance of the mental health issues as well as the complexity um, of the patients. And then we have also seen that many people with TS. It's really enabled us to have a very large and very active clinical research program. And I am an epileptologist, so a lot of the work we do is on the epilepsy, um, but we also have been actively involved in other areas. Um, so again, kind of that is what's developed over 10 years of having a comprehensive program. 
So providing people with TSC, what are our resources? Again, I think these guidelines are key. Um, and that really was a fascinating meeting. People coming from all over the world, experts with different opinions, different experiences, coming up with a kind of what would be the way to follow people and diagnose people. And then I can't say enough how important I think the patient advocacy groups are. Um, the TS, Super Sclerosis um, Australia, the TS Alliance United States, um, where Lisa and I have both been very involved with over the years. Uh, and then also I've been very excited over the past few years about the emergence and the growing of the TS International. I think another strength is the TS community. And again, this is for the medical students, but I think that any medical professional who gets involved with the TS community in any way, it's a remarkable group of people with a passion and willingness to support each other uh, and really work as a team to helping each individual with TSC um, lead a better life. And then the TSC research community. Lisa and I could also, and people here could speak to the fact that Really, these researchers are a group of people who really like to play together. Everyone's in the sandbox trying to understand TSC better, um, to understand the science better, to help develop even better treatments um, and really minimize the effect of this disorder. So I started telling you about Michael, and then I'll finish telling you about Sarah, because uh, I think that this demonstrates in a way how far we've come, and yet though we have a big way to go. Um, so I met Sarah a few days after she was born. She was born, started having seizures, tons of seizures a day, I got transferred into Boston. Three or four weeks went by. By the time she was about five weeks old, she had been on most of our medicines. Um, we had been presenting her at epilepsy surgery conference weekly. No one really wanted to operate on a three to four week old because of the increased morbidity. Um, but when she was five or six weeks old, we knew that we really didn't have an option. So she had epilepsy surgery. Um, she had a large right frontal tuber. This is Sarah at about 10 months old after her surgery. Um, Sarah was seizure free for many years after her surgery has a little bit of weakness on the left, um, both in her arm and leg from the surgery. Um, but her parents would tell you they would gladly take that over the 100 seizures a day we couldn't stop. Um, then this is Sarah in 2006, 2007. Um, and this is Sarah now. Sarah's now in high school. She's a fantastic kid. Uh, her seizures recurred a couple years ago, but are, are well controlled now on single um, anticonvulsant drug. She's had issues with, with anxiety uh, that we've really worked closely with. Uh, and she's being followed. We see her annually to monitor for other aspects of TSC. And Sarah and her family know that it's uncertain where the road is going to lead her, but I think that they have great, great trust and hope that by efforts such as going on here and the research and the clinical care, um, that Sarah will really be able to live a pretty normal life and um, the impact of TSC on her life can be minimized. But if Sarah had not had that surgery, um, Sarah would not be there. Sarah would be probably nonverbal, nonambulatory. She would have a different life. Uh, so again, really, really important to provide comprehensive care, aggressive care, particularly with regard to the seizures and other aspects, uh, to make sure that TSC, we can minimize the impact on people's lives. So anyway, I'm really, really happy to be here and looking forward to the rest of the meeting. And thank you very much.